Hi everyone. So uh, today we will be discussing about the autosclerosis, the third part of autosclerosis. So we'll be continuing from the second part. Today we'll be discussing about the tuning fork test. The tuning fork test. Uh, tuning fork test. The investigations that we have to perform in a case of autosclerosis. The differential diagnosis of autosclerosis and the treatment. What is the treatment of autosclerosis? Okay. So coming to tuning fork test. So what are we talking about? What is the pathogenesis? What is the pathology? It's a conductive hearing loss. So what happens in conductive hearing loss? Bone conduction is better than air conduction. Okay. So this is the basic thing. So what is positive RINI with normal patients and in patients with sensory neural hearing loss, you will have a positive RINI. But here in conductive hearing loss, you will have a negative RINI, which means bone conduction is better than air conduction. Because it is slow and insidious process, initially the 256 hertz becomes the tuning fork, the 256 hertz tuning fork becomes negative. 512 will be positive, then 512 and 1024 will be positive, then 512 starts becoming negative, and finally, as the lesion progresses over a period of many years, the 1024 also becomes negative when the tape is fixed. So, what does it mean that the 256 uh, tuning fork has become negative? It means that there is a minimum hearing loss of 15 decibels. Okay, if 512 hertz has got become negative, it means that there is a minimum 30 decibels of hearing loss. 1024 means there is a 45 decibels of hearing loss. So, one important point that you need to remember is when there is ankylosis or total fixation, total fixation of the stapes foot plate to the oval window you have 60 decibels of hearing loss so it is 15 30 45 50 all of them are changing in 15 30 45 60 all of them are changing in 15 decibel steps so 15 becomes negative now 256 becomes negative means 15 decibels hearing loss 512 becomes negative means 30 decibels of hearing loss 1024 hertz becomes negative means 45 decibels of hearing loss minimum finally 60 decibels means that the foot plate has got fixed okay webers webers uh, you you know how to do the webers right you strike the tuning fork to the elbow or to the heel and then you uh, place it in the midline and you ask the patient which side he is hearing better so Weber is lateralized to the ear with worse conductive deafness. So suppose, for example, if the patient is having a right ear hearing loss of 45 decibels and a left ear hearing loss of 35 decibels, Weber is lateralized to 30, 45 decibels of hearing loss. That is, this patient is having more hearing loss, worse hearing loss on the right side. So Weber, if you place it in the midline, will lateralized to the right ear. Both absolute bone conduction and Schwabach tests are normal because both of these absolute bone conduction and Schwabach tests, they test the sensory neural hearing loss of a patient. So if, because there is no sensory neural hearing loss in almost all the cases, so they will be normal. But they will be decreased as compared to the examiner, that's what this is called, na? absolute bone conduction test and Schwabach, they are decreased in cochlear otosclerosis with sensory neural hearing loss. Whenever there is sensory neural hearing loss, then the absolute bone conduction test and show box will be decreased. So this is about the reigning test. Uh, this is about reigning focus. Let's have a quick recap. So we have uh, the reigning, the negative reigning, first with 256, then with 512, then with 1024 hertz. And then you have Weber's test to be lateralized to the ear with greater conductive hearing loss or the worse ear in conductive hearing loss. Absolute bone conduction test and show box test will be normal in majority of the cases, except in uh, cases with like cochlear autosclerosis where there is sensory neural hearing loss, they will be decreased. Okay, coming to the pure tone audiometry. Pure tone audiometry uh, is the first investigation that you, it's like the go-to investigation for any case that is presenting with hard of hearing. The first investigation that you think of is always, first investigation is always pure tone audiometry. So in pure tone audiometry, you will have, the, it is divided into early and late stages. What are the changes in early pure tone audiometry? You will see a low frequency conductive hearing loss. What is, when, whenever in pure tone audiometry conductive means there is an AB gap or a air bone gap. Here you see, right, there is an air bone gap. There is a gap between the bone conduction curve and the air conduction curve. So in early stages, what is the description? There is low frequency conductive hearing loss. So initially, the low frequencies are getting affected. So here you can see for 250 hertz, it is 60 decibels of hearing loss. For 500 hertz, it is 
50 decibels of hearing loss for thousand it is 50 decibels of hearing loss but as at 8000 and 4000 it is almost coming back to normal so here it is normal almost it is coming back to normal 20 decibels is like normal like this is the threshold right okay so uh, this is called the low frequency early stages you have the low frequency conductive hearing loss so you have to remember this again and again so initially early stages of photosclerosis there is an ear bone gap and there is a low frequency conductive hearing loss low frequency conductive hearing loss bone conduction is normal basically the bone conduction will be actually in the straight line in most of the cases in some cases uh, and the air bone gap will be greater than 15 decibels. This is like uh, the uh, basic feature by which you diagnose a conductive hearing loss. It has to be minimum 15 decibels of air bone gap. Only then you call it a conductive hearing loss. Okay, air bone gap is normal. Uh, sorry, my air bone gap is having a 15 decibels of conductive hearing loss. Bone conduction is normal. In a few cases, you will see a characteristic dip only in the bone conduction curve. Only in the bone conduction curve you will see the car hearts notch car hearts notch in a few cases not in all the cases in some cases you will see uh, a characteristic dip in the bone conduction curve so here it is uh, 0 here it is 5 here it is 10 and at 2000 hertz this is the point right at 2000 hertz you will see a dip in the bone conduction curve at 2000 hertz that dip is called the car hearts notch okay so this car heart snatch disappears after successful stepidectomy. So you are done a successful stepidectomy means car heart snatch will disappear. It will become a straight line afterwards. So why do you have a car heart snatch that is present when there is disease and after a successful stepidectomy there is no car heart snatch? This is because uh, there is, as you heard, have as if you remember the physiology of hearing, each part of the conductive apparatus, the external auditory canal, the tympanic membrane, and the ossicles, they resonate at a particular frequency. They resonate at a particular frequency that is called the resonance of that particular conductive system so the ossicle system uh, resonates best at 2000 hertz because of the stapes fixation that resonance is lost that resonance is lost because of the loss of the resonance at 2000 hertz so you will have a car hearts notch at 2000 hertz okay so that is why you remember the car hearts notch car hearts notch is an important point both from the uh, neat pg point of view and also from the uh, uh, final year exams also car hearts notch is important though it is not seen in all the cases but car hearts notch is a dip only in the bone conduction curve only in the bone conduction curve air conduction you will have a characteristic low frequency conductive hearing loss where the initial stages the initial stages the low frequencies are affected more than the high frequencies high frequencies are almost normal so car hearts notch is a characteristic dip at 2000 hertz it is because of the loss of resonance of the uh, ossicular system because of stapes fixation and that gets successfully resolved when you perform a successful stability in late cases because the because of the toxic materials going into the inner ear you can see sensor neural hearing loss at high frequency high frequency usually sensor neural hearing loss is at high frequency this low frequency is the thing is something that i want you to remember okay in late stages there is sensory neural involvement at high frequencies coming to cochlear autosclerosis so what did we say uh, usually the bone conduction is normal and the low frequency uh, conductive hearing loss is seen and there is an air bone gap sometimes you will see a car heart snatch but sometimes you can see cochlear autosclerosis in cochlear autosclerosis you will see a cookie bite pattern so when you take a cookie and you bite it what you will see a u-shaped trough right that is called a cookie bite pattern why is it called cookie bite pattern because uh, this is a mixed conductive and sensory neural component so there is both conductive is there and sensory neural component is there in cochlear autosclerosis uh, there is uh, the initial frequencies are maintained the low frequencies are maintained and the high frequencies are maintained they are normal but the mid frequencies that we call the speech frequencies you have a mixed conductive and sensory neural hearing loss this is called the cookie bite pattern which is characteristically seen in cochlear autosclerosis there's a greater degree of hearing loss in mid frequencies this is the mid frequencies are getting affected the early frequencies and the late frequencies are being maintained okay so this is about the cookie bite coming to impedance audiometry impedance audiometry as we said the one important point this uh, a Putin audiometry Putin audiometry is called subjective because we give a 
sound stimulus to the patient and the patient hears it and he responds to the uh, to the sound stimulus so not all patients will respond equally some may respond better some may not respond as good so that is an that's not an objective test we cannot depend much on it but it gives you definitely gives you an indication now coming to impedance audiometry it is an objective test so you can depend more on it compared to pewton audiometry characteristically you see a as type curve as type curve is seen what does it mean it means reduced compliance and ambient pressure now we will come to this impedance audiometry curves. All the curves that you see are type A, type AD, type B, type C and type A. This is our AS type of curve. So uh, impedance audiometry, if you can remember, you have external auditory canal, you have the tympanic membrane, this is the middle ear, this is the eustachian tube and this is the cochlear nerve, okay, eighth nerve. And in the middle there is malleus, incus and status. So you put a uh, impedance audiometry probe which is having one is like sound uh, it sends the sound pulses and the second one to record those uh, uh, sound pulses which are coming back and there is also a channel which increases or decreases the pressure of the external artery canal of the external artery canal so that you will see the compliance of the tympano ossicular system of the tympano ossicular system tympano ossicular system what is the compliance compliance is the ease of mobility is the ease of mobility of the tympano ossicular system so it is, it is having more compliance high compliance or normal compliance or low compliance high compliance means it is moving very easily which means there is some there is dislocation ad type so there is compliance is increased here as you can see it is the tallest kind of curve okay a type is normal and as is reduced compliance so you're not reducing you're not doing anything to the pressure in the external article air pressure in millimeter water is this written right so you're not doing anything to the air pressure air pressure you, you're not either decreasing it nor increasing it now you see the type c you can compare it with the type c here it is the same as type a curve the compliance is the same but you have to reduce the pressure in the external artery canal to minus 200 to get this type of curve this is seen in eustachian tube block so this is not an ambient pressure, this is lower pressure. So at ambient pressure, that the pressure that we usually see outside, at ambient pressures, there is a reduced tympano, because of the decreased compliance of the tympanoscular system, there is reduced compliance at ambient pressures. Okay, so this is where you will see, this is pathognomonic. If you see an AS type curve, you should think most probably it's a case of otosclerosis. Okay, right. So impedance audiometry, it's an objective test. AS type of curve is seen, it means there is reduced compliance at ambient pressure. You are not changing the pressure in the external artery canal. You are only you, you are keeping the pressure normal and there is reduced compliance. Why is reduced compliance? Because the stapes is not able to move, right? Acoustic reflex. Now, acoustic reflex, we, we going back a little bit of recap. Um, you, you give a loud sound to the patient and the stapes contracts. Okay? This is the loop that forms, that loop which forms. When the stapes is fixed, the loop breaks. So you will not be able to get this acoustic reflex. The loud sound will come, but the stapes is not moving. So you, you will not see the movement, uh, you will not see the stapedius tendon getting contraction. So in fixed stapes, absent reflex is seen. In acoustic reflex is absent in fixed stapes. In the final stage of autosclerosis, you will see acoustic reflex is absent. In the early stages where there is mobility of the stapes foot plate, uh, acoustic reflex will not be absent. So acoustic reflex is absent in stapes fixation. Now, coming to speech audiometry. What is speech discrimination score? Yes, DS, speech discrimination score. This is an important test. This is speech audiometry. It's an important test. You take some words like spondy words, like sun, bun, cat, rat, like that, and you start giving it to the patient at higher than his threshold. Suppose his threshold is 30, you take it to 40, 50, and start giving these words to the patient through an audiometer or through through some recorded tapes and if the patient can repeat this patient suppose you give 10 words to the patient the patient can repeat nine words back correctly it means that his speech discrimination score is very good that is called speech discrimination score he is able to discriminate the various speech or the speech words uh, in, uh, in in cochlea and in neural the speech discrimination score is reduced so that is how you can differentiate it because this is a conductive hearing loss patient can hear whatever you tell him but you only you have to raise its amplitude or raise the sound raise the volume 
if you raise the volume, he can repeat almost 90 to 100 percent of whatever is told to him. He will repeat. So the speech discrimination score is normal, except in those with cochlear involvement. Cochlear involvement. So when there is cochlear involvement, the speech discrimination score comes down. Okay, there is no recruitment. Recruitment is seen only in uh, cochlear type of hearing loss. There is an abnormal growth of loudness. Okay, this is called abnormal growth of loudness. So what uh, suppose? Uh, 15, 20 decibels, he can, he is not able to hear. At 60 decibels, he is able to hear equal to that other ear. So, that is this type of curve is seen, right? That is called recruitment. It is seen in, it is called abnormal growth of loudness. Abnormal growth of loudness. Abnormal growth of loudness. So, this is uh, characteristic of cochlear lesions. It is not seen in conductive hearing loss. That is why remembering the pathogenesis is very important. So, no recruitment is seen in cases of autosclerosis. CT scan. CT scan uh, is very important. It is, is important if you are taking up the patient for surgery. Uh, one thing is you confirm the diagnosis with a high resolution CT scan of the temporal bone, HRCT temporal bone. You can see the loss of definition of the margin to the oval window. So the oval window is not very clear, right? The loss of definition because there is new sp spongy bone formation. What does CT scan do? CT scan looks at bony, uh, bony tissues very well. MRI looks at the soft tissues very well. So CT scan, you can see the loss of definition of the margins of the oval window. Okay. Before taking up the surgery, you can also see if there is a high riding jugular bulb, descent jugular bulb, because you are working in that area, right? External, this is the middle ear looking at to, through the external artery canal. So this is uh, this is the incus and here you have the stapes, here is the long process of the incus in the posterior superior quadrant. Uh, if the jugular bulb is high and you try to raise the tympanometer flap, you may injure it. So, high riding jugular bulb, descent jugular bulb. But also, the facial nerve is where is the facial nerve? Facial nerve is just behind, posterior superior to the oval window. So, if there is a descent facial nerve, you have to be more careful because you don't want to uh, damage the facial nerve and cause facial paralysis or paralysis to this patient. So, uh, CT scan is helpful to uh, find out if there is a high riding jugular bulb, if there is a descent jugular bulb or if there is a descent facial nerve. Now, coming to the differential diagnosis of uh, otosclerosis. So, any condition which is having conductive hearing loss, we have to put it in the differential diagnosis. Okay, what are the various common type of conductive hearing loss that we see which we have, we have to differentiate it from otosclerosis. The first one is serous otitis media. Serous otitis media is quite easy in a way that when you look at the tympanic membrane, there are there are air bubbles, there are air bubbles behind the tympanic membrane. Sometimes there can be an air fluid level, uh, air fluid level can be there. Uh, you can see you can see that there is in, in the audiogram you can see that there is a B type audiogram will be seen that we have just now gone through. B type it is a flat type of curve. This this flat type of curve is seen. It's a type B type of uh, type B type of tympanogram is seen, right? Uh, and also sometimes the tympanic membrane appears bluish in color. Okay. So because of this, because there are so many features right there in the tympanic membrane that you can see, that you can differentiate it from serious otitis media. Adhesive otitis media also, basically you can see that there is a retraction pocket, which is a severe retraction pocket involving the entire posterior quadrant of the tympanic membrane. Okay, and uh, the long process is gone, there you cannot see the long process of the incus. This is basically the uh, uh, facial nerve, you can see the facial nerve, you can see the round window. It is basically plastered to the promontory. This is almost like grade 4 retraction and also the posterior superior quadrant, the bone also there is uh, some, the, the disease is eating the bone, it is starting to become antiquantral disease also sometimes in this case. So you can easily look at it uh, and say that it is not a case of otosclerosis, this is a case of otitis media, though this also causes conductive hearing loss only, conductive hearing loss. Uh, this sometimes uh, you can see a type C tympanogram because of eustachian tube block, this happens in eustachian tube block. So you can see a type C tympanogram. That's also you can differentiate it from otosclerosis. Now coming to tympanosclerosis. Tympanosclerosis is also easy compared to otosclerosis. Uh, tympanosclerosis. Uh, in otosclerosis, the tympanic membrane is in normal condition. You can't see anything other than the Schwartz sign or the flamingo pink sign. Flamingo pink sign. You don't see any other thing, and that is in only 10% of the cases. So tympanosclerosis, you have this patch, the white patch that is present on the fibrous layer of the tympanic membrane. That is by, by this you can say. Tympanosclerosis, if it is involving only the tympanic membrane, very less uh, hearing loss will be there. But if it is involving the ossicles, the 
hearing loss is greater okay so tympanosclerosis we can uh, also again the same thing you will not be able you will be probably seeing even an as type of a curve also in tympanosclerosis if it's involving ossicles and the staples but basically you can see something like this white patch which differentiates it from otosclerosis ossicular discontinuity ossicular discontinuity and there also in tympanosclerosis you can have there is also a chance of having a past history of ear infections like serous otitis media or acute separative otitis media also you can have this kind of conditions ossicular discontinuity there is a pakka history of trauma so there will be a history of trauma it is quite severe like a road traffic accident and uh, you will see an ad type of curve there is increased compliance at ambient pressure at ambient pressure there is increased compliance the the, 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 the ossicles are able to easily move more easily than normal so there is a past history of trauma tympanic membrane may be normal in such cases most of the cases tympanic membrane will be normal but because of trauma there will be ossicular discontinuity these two cases one is attic fixation of the head of the malleus and congenital staples fixation uh, these are very rare conditions they are very rare conditions now how do you diagnose uh, uh, attic fixation of the head of the malleus how do you differentiate it from otosclerosis Diagnosis is made on pneumatic otoscopy. Seagull speculum, you put it in the tympanic membrane, and you watch whether the tympanic whether the there is any mobility of the lateral process of the malleus or the handle of the malleus or the ungo. Uh, whether the, there is this is a tympanic membrane. This is the handle of the malleus. This is the lateral process of the malleus. This is the this is the ungo and this is the cone of light. So if there is no mobility of the lateral process of the malleus or the handle of the malleus or the tip of the handle of the malleus. Ambo tip of the hand of the malleus doesn't move. Then you can think that it is atic fixation of the head of the malleus. One important feature of uh, malleus fixation is these cases are strictly unilateral. These cases are strictly unilateral, whereas otosclerosis is frequently a bilateral condition. Otosclerosis is bilateral. Atic fixation of the handle of the malleus is unilateral. This is how also you can remember it. Atic fixation of handle of the malleus is unilateral. Whereas otosclerosis is frequently a bilateral condition. Congenital staples fixation is also a very rare kind of condition. Uh, you differentiate it. This is a non-progressive kind of deafness. Whereas otosclerosis is a progressive deafness. Otosclerosis is progressive. Whereas otosclerosis is progressive. Congenital staples fixation is non-progressive. So the patient comes to you. You get a you get a PTA and a, and an impedance audiometry. A patient comes again after six months and. Uh, you again get a PTA and an impedance audiometry like this. Every uh, keep assessing the patient, and there is non-progressive. Always they are the same. The the PTA values and the impedance audiometry they are always the same value. You can put it mostly in congenital congenital staples fixation. Okay, uh, whereas in a case of otosclerosis, this is the characteristic based on the pathogenesis because uh, there is new bone formation and uh, and the staples foot plate is progressively getting fixed to the old window. So otosclerosis is progressive, congenital staples fixation is non-progressive, attic fixation is unilateral, and uh, uh, otosclerosis is a bilateral condition. Now coming to treatment. Treatment of otosclerosis, treatment always comes, you always have a medical and a surgical subheadings, okay. Medical treatment of otosclerosis, there is no medical treatment that cures. Why? Because it is a spongy bone coming from the immature cell rest. Uh, and they keep on, you know, growing onto the four staples foot plate and causing staples fixation progressively. So there is nothing that you can really do to stop its growth. Okay, there is nothing you can do to really stop it. There is no medical treatment. That is, there is you don't have any tablets. There are no injections to stop this uh, problem, just to, to cure this problem. You can stop it to some extent with sodium fluoride, but there is no problem that cures it. You will not get a normal hearing when you give sodium fluoride. Why? There is only only in those 10% of cases that come to you with active focus and this active focus is causing tinnitus and there is also sometimes you are getting sensory neural hearing. In such cases you can give sodium fluoride. Why? Because it hastens the maturity of the active focus and arrests further cochlear loss. So what does sodium fluoride do? Sodium fluoride is decreasing the osteoblastic activity. So sorry, it is increasing the osteoblastic activity. So new bone formation is uh, increased and it is decreasing the osteoclastic activity decreasing the osteoclastic activity. the bone resorption is being decreased and the bone formation is increased thereby mature bone formation occurs faster than when you leave it to nature so by this you can arrest the 
the the yeah, the the severity of the hearing loss and also this tinnitus and sensorineural hearing loss also you can give some relief but sodium fluoride is not like it's a treatment of choice nearly it's a controversial treatment there are some contraindications also it is not a very safe drug but uh, in medical treatment yes we have to mention sodium fluoride because it hastens the maturity of the active lesion and it arrests further cochlear loss the, the treatment of choice, the go-to treatment for autosclerosis is either stepidectomy or stepidotomy. So whatever that step is, is there, which is fixed uh, to the oval window, you either remove it. If you remove it, it is called the stepidectomy. If you make a perforation of a hole in the footplate of the stapes, it is called stepidotomy with processes placement. What is the use of removing the stapes if you do not put a processes? If you put a processes, then that, that the patient, you are basically replacing a, a, a non-functional ossicle with a processes which is functional now. This is the treatment of choice. Okay, Here you can see, this is the tympanic membrane, this is the tympanic membrane, this is the malleus, this is the incus and this is the staples. So here the staples is getting fixed because there may be an anterior focus, posterior focus or obliterative or circumferential. These are different types of stapedial autosclerosis. So you remove the, uh, you do not touch the lenticular process of the incus. You remove the head of the staples, you remove the neck of the staples, you remove the anterior crura and the posterior crura from the staples foot plate, the staples foot plate, right? You remove it, remove this head, neck and anterior crura and posterior crura, you remove it. Uh, take it out and you make a perforation or a hole in the staples foot plate and you put a process. So this is the processes. The most common processes that is, that we use is a Teflon processes, a Teflon piston. The other ones are, it's important to mention, stainless steel piston, platinum piston and titanium Teflon piston. So various types of pistons are one is Teflon piston, second one is stainless steel piston, third one is platinum, fourth one is titanium Teflon piston. So these are the four types of piston that we use. So this is basically a piston, right? So this is this is the place where you put the, uh, uh, this is a long process of the incus, around the long process of the incus you put this round one, uh, around it and then you crimp it and this part goes into the perforation on the staples foot plate. Okay, so that this can move up and down and the uh, vibrations uh, because of the sound vibrations which are transmitted from the tympanic from the tympanic membrane to the malleus incus are transmitted to the inner ear to the cochlea to the inner ear 90% of the cases have a good improvement in hearing after stepidectomy or stepidotomy so stepidectomy or stepidotomy though it is not a 100% successful operation it is 90% that is like out of 100 patients 90 patients are going to have a good improvement in hearing after stepidotomy or stepidectomy 